Long, long ago, in a time unrecorded and only vaguely remembered, there was a country of misty forests, placid bays, and soaring mountains. It was called Clinket, which meant Earth to the people who lived there. Today, it is called Southeastern Alaska, and its native people are the Clinkets and the Haidas. Waterfalls, lakes, and streams are everywhere, yet it was not always so. Once there was Raven, the Clinkets, the mountains, and only salt water to drink. One day, while Raven was out fishing with a man named Petrol, this is a story about the Raven and a Petrol testing one another. Raven finally became convinced when his brother-in-law took off his fork hat and put it behind him. The fork said in, Petro putting his hat back on the fork lifted. They were sailing. Banuk, Dukani, Ayatiinada. They were sailing towards Petro's place. After they arrived, they went inside, sat near the fire, and began to eat the evening meal. Uh, after finishing their evening meal, uh, Petrol reached over, uh, lifted the cover, dipped water from his well, been protecting. Uh, after evening, eating the evening meal and drinking the water from his well, he felt fine. Raven kept an eye on his brother-in-law, the Petro. Raven could see that Petro felt very sleepy. Fell asleep. Petro fell asleep. Raven saw a dark mist. Horse flies around it. Threw it over under his brother and dropped the stick. You are a Dukane. Shaking his brother in law. Told him, Go outside. You've messed up yourself. I am not our tan Dukane Hine. Raven reached over, removed the cover, dipped the water, and drank it. Dipped again. Drank some more water. Dipped again and drank more water. Raven began to change his form. Raven changed his form and turned white. Taken off and flying up, Raven got stuck at the smoke hole. The fire spirit held him there and began to change color. Came out black. Start flying in a northerly direction. Flying north, where there had been no water before, the water dripping from the side of Raven's mouth, now created lakes, big ones and small ones, streams that were not there before. The totem was the cultural mirror of the Tlingit Indians of southeastern Alaska. It reflected their legends and expressed their belief in the kinship of men and animals.
the origins of the two great divisions or fratries of the blankets were traced to the raven and the eagle through the legends and clan histories carved beneath the crest of their totems. If one lived under an eagle totem, one must marry a member of the raven fratry, and vice versa. In daily intercourse, people were treated and respected according to their family totem. The amount to be spent on the dead, uh, what one should receive at a potlatch or a feast, the paraphernalia one should wear at a dance, the voice one should have in public affairs, the size of one's house, and the naming of children were all decided by a man's totem. Indeed, the totemic crest was the identity of a clinket. It represented his history, family, clan, spiritual beliefs, and offered the protection of his tribe or fratry. For these reasons, he carved or painted his totemic designs upon everything he built. Central to Plinket life was the potlatch. Potlatches were usually given in midwinter and late summer. During these celebrations, the hosts could display their wealth and generosity, thereby raising their status and incurring the indebtedness of their guests. The guests were seated and given gifts according to their totemic rank and the respect held for them by the hosts. The visiting clans were of the opposite fratry and were obliged to return the favors of the potlatch at some future date. Potlatches were given when a clan member died, a child reached puberty, a house was built, and on other special occasions. After a good season of fishing, hunting, trapping, and berry picking, a potlatch was often given to share the excess food and repay old obligations. Feasting, joking, dancing, singing, and a competition between clans and shaman took place. On the last day of the celebration, there was a distribution of gifts from the host. The best of friends and the worst of enemies were made at potlatches, where the spirit of Plinket life was at its strongest. Though the Plinkets were warlike, they were more concerned with wealth and prestige than the ways of war. The rich man, bearing the rings of many potlatches upon his hat, was admired more than the warrior. The Chilcats to the north were the richest and most powerful of the Plinket peoples. Their fierce aspect and shrewd bartering enabled them to dictate their own price to the more peaceable Athabascans of the interior with whom they traded. In warfare, surprise, cunning, and ambush, spear, bow, and club were the Plinket's main weapons. Many tribes of the Aleuts, who were a mild people, enlisted by the Russians as seal hunters, were decimated by the Tlinkets. A Tlinket who died a violent death did not go to the afterlife beyond the mountains, but into the sky where he would dance as the northern lights when someone was about to be murdered or a war was about to break out. In old times, the dead were cremated, their ashes deposited in totem poles, except for the shaman or witch doctor who was embalmed. Slaves were dumped into the river or the sea. The Plinkets suffered keenly over the death of their loved ones. If a man should die and his aunt should give birth to a son, it was believed that the son would be the possessor of the dead man's soul, and the son would be named after the dead man. The shaman, or Ict, was the most respected and feared of all the tribe. He was consecrated for his office in infancy, and neither scissors nor water could ever touch his hair since they would lessen his power. While young, the shaman spent months alone in the forest, invoking the spirits, increasing his powers. When he returned to the village, he was able to cast off the evil spirits that caused diseases, swamped canoes, and helped enemies to triumph. If his remedy failed, he might accuse a member of the village of witchcraft. The witch would be tortured and killed. Sun, stars, moon, salmon, and trees all had spirits, as did everything in nature, spirits who could hear and see. People, therefore, had to be cautious and respectful when speaking about them. Nature sustained the Plinkets, and because of its bounty, the villages were able to reap the greater portion of their diet during the summer and have time to celebrate, carve, and weave during the winter. In July, when the winds were westerly and the sailing good, trade between the Plinket villages flourished. 
household groups and clans would travel hundreds of miles to barter their local foods and tools for those of their southern or northern neighbors. The Haidas, with their access to the light, soft yellow cedar of the southern archipelago, were master craftsmen in totemic carvings and canoe building. The Chilcats to the north controlled the main mountain passes into the interior, and they were the middlemen in trade between the Athabascans and the people of southeastern Alaska. Vanity and pride were characteristic of the Clinkets. Vain in their fondness for fine clothes and lavish potlatches, the tattoos and lip plugs which were once customary, and vain in their feeling that he who could afford to destroy the most personal property, whether blankets or slaves, was the greater individual. There was pride in their ability to endure pain, pride in the virtues of their ancestors, in the rigors of the warrior, the powers of the shaman, the art of the carver, the dancer and song maker, and pride in the nobility and wealth of a clan. Since childhood, they had grown in freedom, and freedom especially was dear to them. They hated to be bossed and despised the slave as the lowest form of life. Pride and respect made the Tlingit very sensitive to slight or insult. Patience enabled him to wait for years to avenge his hurt should the offender not make monetary reparation or offer a potlatch in his honor. In marriage, the relatives were the matchmakers. Their selection of a groom was based on his accomplishments, his family, caste, and the expected size of his bridal gift. The bride had to be of the opposite fratry or tribe and was chosen for her caste, modesty, housekeeping abilities, and for her skill in making beadwork or weaving baskets out of spruce root. Children were cherished by the Clinkets, and it was considered a measure of parental love to give the children what they wished. A child's fratry was that of its mother, and a son was raised by his mother's brother to become a man, while a daughter was instructed by her mother in the skills and manners of womanhood. To many white men, the Clinkets appeared to be a solemn and humorless people, yet among themselves, they are continually joking, laughing, and making funny remarks. We have been with them in camp and in their homes, have frequently been at their socials, and can truly say that never have we seen a people, as a class, take life more happily, evince more humor, and bubble over more with laughter. While the Clinkets admired shrewdness, cunning, and trickery, as embodied in Raven, they respected one another's territorial fishing and trading rights, and were basically honest. No man's house was ever robbed, nor his wood stolen, nor cut and banked in the forest. His garden was not plundered, though miles from his home. In matters of justice, the chief was the ruling voice. To the Clinket, wounded feelings, as well as injury or the invasion of property rights, had to be atoned for. If a Clinket accidentally injured someone while attempting to help them, he could be sued for damages. Because of this, people were cautious about whom they helped. Caste regulated the dealing out of justice. If a raven woman killed an eagle man, a raven man's life, rather than that of the murderess, must be taken in reparation. A high caste man had his ear bitten off in a brawl. The life of a low caste man was taken in reparation. If one of high caste did injury to one of low caste, the person of high caste would usually pay for his crime with blankets. The arrival of white civilization made the Indian subject to two codes of law, his and the white man's. From 1558 to the late 1790s, European expeditions representing the major empires of the world explored Alaska. Vitus Bering made his voyage from Russia to Kamchatka in 1741. In the late 18th century, men like Perez, Bodega, La Perouse, Vancouver, and Captain Cook sailed the waters of southeastern Alaska, making maps and bartering with the natives. Then came the fur traders, the English, Spanish, Americans, and especially the Russians. <laughs> With the help of the Aleuts, whom the Russians had terrorized into compliance, 
and the attraction of new unexploited hunting grounds for sea otter, seal, and other fur-bearing animals, Alexander Baranov, the chief administrator of Russian America, ventured into southeastern Alaska to establish trading companies. His reception by the fierce tribes of Yakutat Bay and those of the Chilkat area was hostile. Yet in 1799, the brave and enterprising Baranov founded a fort and trading post at New Archangel, the present site of Sitka. Baranov's headquarters were in Kodiak, and shortly after his return there, the fort of New Archangel was destroyed by the Sitka Tlingits, its defenders massacred. In 1808, Baranov returned to New Archangel to establish it as his new home in the capital of Russian America. Eventually, the Russians were able to live with the Clinkets, adapting themselves to the native customs while preserving their own culture through schools and the Russian church. Russian priests had established missions in Alaska, and Father Vinyaminov began teaching Christian principles to the native children. When the United States purchased Alaska in 1867, the Russian schools in Sitka were closed. New schools were not established for over 10 years when the Presbyterian Church initiated American missionary activity in Alaska. The Americans largely ignored Plinket customs or regarded them with disdain while pursuing their own fortunes. Many of the Plinket traditions eroded while the natives took on the ways of the whites. Gold mines, fish canneries, and whaling stations lured young Plinkets from the villages to work in the new towns. Industry began to absorb the Clinket economy, while the work of the missionaries began to change the Clinket's basic beliefs. By the united efforts of the officials of the civil government and the missionaries, this barbarous practice of shamanism has been practically broken up. Some of the shamans have been subjected to summary punishment in cases where the law could not readily be invoked. Others have been indicted and convicted, and this, together with the teachings of the missionaries, has served to practically eradicate from among them the chief superstition to which they were for centuries the abject slaves. school life? Well, we Clinket people never had schools among us before, and we didn't know how to live right. Now we have teachers to teach us how. It is in school we are getting strong. When we grow up, we will be leaders of our people. I don't think they know anything about the good life. No, they don't. Only we know, so we must tell them about it. After nearly 150 years under the influence of the Russians and the Americans, the Clinket people have mixed feelings about the way of life they have increasingly become involved in. Though they are aware of the benefits of modern life, they regret the hard sacrifices they have been forced to make in order to share contemporary comforts. Well, when I was growing up, I, was, uh, I grew up as a Clinket 
that was my first language. We, we didn't go to school until I, I didn't go to school until I was about 11 years old. And it shows how much thinker I was. I didn't even know I had a last name. At first, we, we I couldn't remember anything much of the Tlingit culture, except uh, when my grandma is talking to us, you know, she, she shows us a lot of stuff, and, and she used to tell us how it's done and why. The spirit that controlled every thought, every action, and every deed, and this concept of space in a Tlingit way of living, the Tlingit style of living, yik. The spirit in the air, in everything alive, the water was spoken of as a spirit, the weather, the change of season, the animals, all have spirits, but controlled by a more powerful spirit, more powerful than a spoken word, more powerful than the ich, now spoken of as shamans. And so after I understood it thoroughly, and uh, the missionaries were already here when I started to, to learn about the Tlingit culture. So they didn't, they didn't practice it too much then. They just uh, sort of laid aside because the missionaries won't let them do it. They thought, the missionaries thought the Tlingits were uh, worshipping this stuff we have as our emblem. But really we, we weren't worshipping them. We just had a respect for those things because it belonged to us. And without those, our people will never recognize us. I myself, when I went to school, they punished me because I was speaking in Tlingit language. Sometimes we were slapped for saying a Tlingit word. So, we, so I made a vow, not only me, but uh, some of those that were going to school, that we'll never talk Tlingit to our kids. Conservation laws have also made it difficult for the Tlingits to retain much of their traditional diet. The old way of life was good for us. We used to get fish from the creek as many as we want. Now the wildlife won't allow to kill any fish. Some of the fish and creeks are closed. We can hook and grab the hook from the creek like we used to. So we have no dry fishing in town. And just later in years, they made it difficult for us to even pick seagull eggs. We can't even take that for our own use. Uh, you get penalized if you get caught with one egg of a seagull egg. And now I don't even know what a seagull egg tastes like. We were picking that low bush cranberries. There were lots. That's where we used to pick before it was free. Because it's our land. We pick berries any place we go, we pick it. And this man came out with his wife, and my cousin and I were picking alongside the road highway. And then he told us if we don't move from there, he got a gun in the house. Now, what does he mean he got a gun in the house? We're not a deer, we're not a dog. Well, uh, the Clinton people had a great respect for each other and for everything around them. Sometimes when, when we build a new house, when we are dedicating the Clinton way, we are giving a respect to the lumber, lumber people, I'd say, the tree people. There is no, no space for us. No, we can't say no place. It's all taken. We were too kind. A new generation, cut off from their language and their past, has begun to replace the old people who die with their skills and their memories. New way of life. Some of our young people, they're interesting of that. And they don't care. The young people don't care about their own way of life. They would like to identify themselves with something from the past. For example, suppose in our museum or in some, in some other place, they see on display in public something from the past. Maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now they come by and see the items still there. 
one may be heard to say. So this, this is something from our culture. Uh, I can recognize it. It sure looks like something from our culture. That would be about all that whatever they know about their people, their past, would amount to. Now compared to the older generation, they know about these things. It's a part of them, and it makes for a better feeling, too, by being able to pass this information along to other people. You see, the generation before me uh, could be able to speak their own tongue, and you find most of them are pretty interested in not real big demanding jobs like working in an office or whatnot. Their, I think their main interest is still lies in the realm of fishing. They still have their heart in it. And I think the people that live my generation, I find that most people find that they, they want to take a real interest in office work, working in governmental jobs and this type of thing. Some of our younger generation went fishing in order for them to meet they need in high school or whatever college they attend to. They took the liberty of changing their own ways just by copying our associates. And this is the way that Clinket life has been changing from time to this day and age. And everything has begun modern, so we have to keep up with the time. In the old culture, there was a sense of security a sense of belonging. This was when we had more native peoples living in the local areas. They were fully aware of an uh, intertribal relationship of being related to other people in the outlying districts, which is one reason why respect for one another was maintained. Oh, my grandmother was uh, a very tall person. And we really respected her and obeyed her because everything she said was a law to us. And she had a feeling that uh, if we learn too much of the white man's way too, that we'll lose our culture, that we'll lose respect for our, our own people. This is what she had in mind. And I think this is what happened. A long time ago, there was boats that would come in now and then. And there'd be relatives aboard the boat and they'd invite them into the house to have a bite to eat. Sort of like a fellowship type thing. They get together and greet each other and they'd be pretty happy. And <coughs> it seems to me that a lot of this doesn't happen anymore. Uh, a long time ago there was this sort of a fellowship. There was either storytelling uh, there was a sort of a unity and uh, uh, sharing in, in foods, whereas nowadays uh, a lot of times it's, uh, it isn't uh, even thought of because they go in there and they get it all over them. Whether the heritage of the Clinkets can exist in hearts as well as in museums is a question unanswered. New problems of survival require new approaches and explanations. Can the beauty of the past be preserved as a curiosity, or must it be fused with a people's spirit? This is an uncertainty which history shall answer. In return for the many wonderful things we have received from your society, the non-native way of doing things, I am repeating a wish expressed by grandparents many years ago upon departing from one another the grandparents were often heard to say god kshaha kinak yege yigin khustik chukud seji waha kshnik kshtuudi chstuwusakko chwakawate sakhe jitke may the spirit that roams above us more powerful than the spoken word, more powerful than the shaman, more powerful than the primitive tools and weapons used by our people. Protect you 
and all of your beloved ones, your friends, other relatives who are away from you, keep you in good health, free from worry, happy for the rest of your natural lives. 